you're in a B-17 Flying Fortress. You've got four engines and you take off. Number four engine almost immediately starts backfiring and the captain shuts it down. Then you turn back to the airport and the engine next to it stops and you've already dropped your gear. You can't maintain altitude. You hit the approach lights, impact the ground and slide into a storage tank. Out of 13 people aboard, seven are now dead, including the captain. Talking about the B-17 crash in Connecticut on October 2nd, 2019 on this episode, Taking Off. Hi, I'm Dan Milliken, and this is the second time I'm recording this, a summary of the NTSB docket on the tragic crash of a 1944 B-17 Flying Fortress in Connecticut on October 2nd, 2019. You see, I love the old warbirds, and my two favorite planes in the world are the F-4U Corsair and the B-17 Flying Fortress. I shot this report for you and started pulling B-roll for it as I sat down to edit, and then I remembered, I had some footage of my Cessna 210 sitting next to a B-17. I went through my library, sure enough found it and zoomed in. It's the same B-17 that I just talked about crashing about six months after shooting my footage on the ramp in Oklahoma. I know it really shouldn't change anything, but it did. And I threw away my first stand-up and so here I am. Why the change? Well, my first focus, what I pulled from the NTSB docket, was the need for training. And then after shooting, I went through some more of the information, and I talked to someone who knew the crew. And while training is crucial, and we don't have enough of it, I pulled some other things that'll make me a better pilot and a better person. Here's a quick rundown on what we're talking about. A B-17 World War II bomber that was built in 1944 had been used for years to give what are called living history flight experience to people all over the country. It was run by the Collings Foundation and it would cross the country giving several rides each day at different locations. On this October 2nd, it gave its final short ride. After taking off, the B-17 experienced engine trouble and tried to return to the airport, crashing short of the runway. The pilot was Ernest Mack McCauley. He was 75 years old and no one on the planet had more time flying a B-17 than Mack. He was the kind of guy, if you knew him and he was visiting your city, you would connect and go grab some dinner and trade stories. And I say this because after reading through the NTSB docket, I got a feeling they're going to point some fingers his way. And we'll touch on that in a moment and maybe deservedly so and more fingers will undoubtedly be pointed towards the Collings Foundation. Reading the transcripts, the testimonies are certainly throwing the foundation under the bus, and maybe that's fair. And we'll get to their role in a moment as well. To understand, let's dive in on that morning. Pre-flight was done and passengers loaded, and when Mac went to start the engines, he starts with number three and it wouldn't start. A mechanic with a pressurized bottle of nitrogen went out and blew out the mags, that's removing the moisture, and then the engine started. He moved to number four, which also wouldn't start. So they had to shut down number three, blow out the mags for number four, and then both three and four were started, and then the others. They did a standard run-up to check the engines according to the surviving crew member, loadmaster and flight engineer, Mitch Melton. And he said the run-up was fine, no anomalies. Or was there a run-up? Survivor testimonies record they never heard the engines revved up for a run-up. So we have some conflict in reports there. Melton was the liaison for the passengers. He positioned them about the plane and then went to the flight deck. And as soon as the wheels left the pavement, he left the flight deck to make sure the passengers knew they could move about. Yes, on an American Airlines or United flight, you have to remain seated for a much longer time because in the regulations, the airlines fly under part 121, seat belts have to stay on below 10,000 feet. But this flight was flying under part 91 rules, which are the same for my Cessna 210. And as soon as the airplane is in flight, my passengers can unbuckle. And the reason is that the flight is short and the foundation wants the passengers to have the most time they can to walk around the plane in flight and check out all the positions. So the plane takes off and immediately Melton moves out of the flight deck to let the passengers know they can move. And within two minutes, engine number four starts running rough. And to give you an idea of how fast everything happens, 
the plane started its roll at 46 minutes past the hour and 15 seconds. Three minutes after starting the roll, the B-17 requests immediate return. So the engine had already become a problem. And four minutes later, it's all over. About seven minutes start to finish. And what happened? One passenger reported hearing backfiring coming from the engine on the right side. Melton says he returned to the flight deck to find Mac wanting to shut down engine number four. Melton testifies that Mac immediately caged it, and that's feathering and shutting down the rough running engine without waiting for an agreement from the co-pilot. Now, Melton says he voiced it wasn't ready, and then he left the flight deck to tell everyone to return to their seats and buckle in. Meanwhile, the B-17 tells air traffic control they're having a rough mag. AT responds with the question, do you need assistance? Which the response from the B-17 was no. They did not declare an emergency. It was at this point Mac turned back towards the airport. He never got higher than 600 feet above the ground the entire short flight. So a rough running engine four was shut down, gear was dropped, and at some point then engine three quit. And we know this because the blades were not turning at impact. The other two engines, one and two, were firewalled. Mac had his hands full now. He was losing altitude, and this low, he was running out of options. The plane clipped the landing lights, and a couple of passengers in the back saw the orange plastic fly by. Moments later, impact with the ground. At first, one survivor thought it was going to be okay, and then the plane swerved hard right and into the de-icing tank, broke apart, fire. The passenger in the rear was a command sergeant major, and he and a buddy had bought a ticket because of a love of the old warbirds. Fortunately, he knew how to operate the old military seatbelts and knew how to open the back hatch. No one had briefed them on even how to work the seatbelts, let alone emergency exits. But the command sergeant major was able to get out and his buddy, and in trying to get back in, the heat was too much as the third person rolled out on fire. They were able to extinguish the flames of the passenger who suffered some burns. Up in the front, Melton momentarily blacked out on impact and came to with his arm stuck to some metal. He pulled himself off and egressed out of a hatch. The two forwardmost passengers didn't see where he went, but saw an opening behind the co-pilot and escaped onto the de-icing tank. And by the way, there is conflicting testimony about this. Melton says the two followed him out, while the two passengers stated they never saw him. And those were the only survivors. And without the command sergeant major in the back, there probably would have been three less survivors. One of the survivors testified that out of all the times they'd heard the airline passenger safety briefing, the one time it would have really been useful, they got nothing. The FAA suspended the exemption of the Collings Foundation to fly passengers, and as you can imagine, things are a mess. And here's where I wanted to part a little from the training focus from my now deleted first stab at this. Mac was the most qualified pilot on the planet to fly this plane. Yes, there were check rides and everything was marked satisfactory for him, but us pilots know check rides are not training. In fact, training is not supposed to occur on check rides. And there's no doubt better training might have led to a different outcome in this situation. But as the people will start to gather after reading the NTSB docket and sharpen their knives for Mac and the Collings Foundation, there's something else I'm really worried about with this accident. When I got the privilege to climb up inside this B-17, it was nothing short of amazing. This was indeed living history. To actually ride in it flying would have been an incredible memory. And the other warbirds that can give us the chance, the privilege to experience history in this way, is an incredibly important thing. Something I hope we don't knee-jerk toss into the trash. The horrible crash wasn't one thing. It wasn't one engine failure. It wasn't that the pilots didn't wear shoulder harnesses. It was many things. It was what looked like two engine failures on the same side. It was delaying a little before turning back to the airport. It was lowering the gear early, which increased the drag and they lost precious altitude. It was a lack of safety briefing for the passengers. Many, many things here. I hate to see more regulation and legislation strangling history away from us. I'm hoping that those who operate living history flights will not only have better procedures, but actually implement and follow them. Instead of government mandating a bunch of rules, I want the aviation community to police themselves. CRM, crew or cockpit resource management, while mandatory for the airlines, 
isn't for these type of flights. But that program was developed from the blood of thousands. We'd be foolish not to implement that in these flights. For the family and friends of those taken too early from them by this tragedy, my heart goes out and we need to do better. We need to have better policies and procedures in place that will prevent this from happening again. To the little kids I saw on the ramp that day, running from plane to plane, looking big-eyed at the B-17 and the Mustang and the Mitchell, I hope this opportunity to experience history will not be lost for you. And to the Collings Foundation, I appreciate how you endeavored to bring history to the people, and I hope you are able to resume that at some point. I ask that you make it as safe as possible for the people you are sharing this incredible history with. And for the others sharing this aviation history for people, I pray that you can continue without being too heavily burdened by the bureaucracy that comes from this, that you don't park the planes in dusty hangars for us to slowly forget. Other things to take away that can make me a better pilot and a better person, well, don't be hesitant or afraid to declare an emergency. Had the crew declared when they shut down engine number four, the emergency vehicles would have had a four minute head start minutes that mattered. For me, I need to continue to up my safety game. I can do more. I can train better, train smarter. I pre-brief takeoffs now and I go through emergency procedures. But when was the last time I practiced a rejected takeoff or an emergency landing? I can tell you my last practice of an emergency landing was on my CFI check ride a year and a half ago. For me personally, that's not good enough. So that's on me and what I take away. What about you? Are your procedures in place? Do your passengers know how to get out of a plane in an emergency? Do you regularly train so that it'll be muscle memory in an emergency and your brain can focus on the more important things? Let me know in the comments below. And for non-pilots, training is just as important. Of course it work, but think about any emergency you might encounter. Are you ready for that? What if you have a vehicle breakdown? Do you have important items in your car that can help you? What if a natural disaster hits your area? Are you trained and ready for that? Walking to your car at night in the parking lot. Are you trained to handle someone attacking you? What, you don't think that's a real possibility these days? Or do you just have your phone stuck to your ear as you reach for your keys, totally unaware of what's going on? Just some things to think about. Superior judgment trumps superior skills, but you still need to train those skills. We'll see you later.